Um, we are actually, you know, I, I want to do the health and safety, and then I want to introduce the question. We do not expect any kind of this. You cannot expect any fibers. So if you want some studies in review, and if you do, uh, please follow either uh, Katie, who is out there, Joe, or myself outside here, and we carry on the grass and the grass in front of here. There are no small emergency exits. If there's a fire out there, we'll take it back to the back exit. Um, for us, I just on my on my right here, and um, as many of you have already discovered, we are uh, serving uh, alcoholic beverages. Please make sure that you realize that the people that are sitting at home don't you home safe. So please do be and family and friends favor and drink responsibly. And uh, without further ado, for the people that do not know Blink Innovation, Blink Innovation. We are a full business unit of Lincoln University. We basically foster and, and, and connecting <coughs> people together. So that's what this is all about as well, right? Because I had to use a glass and, 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 and to make some noise to quiet you down because you guys were doing it, you guys were talking, you guys were connecting. Whether it's in in context or, or, or existing context, we truly believe that we can bring people together and there is, there is context, and that is the basis of collaboration. And we truly believe that when collaboration that actually starts with people that are really passionate about the same topic, that innovation is the very natural thing that will occur there afterwards. So that's what we do here at the European at Innovation. We do run um, uh, multiple workshops. We have a co-working space and we have uh, we facilitated uh, meetings for students as well. Um, which and um, Rachel, uh, Rachel studied at um, Massey University. Well, luckily, she did her PhD very little. And luckily, I can say that I'm a colleague of, uh, uh, of, of Rachel. We worked together in um, the Living Laboratory. But before I was actually becoming a colleague in the Living Laboratory, she already did a little laboratory here when it, when it comes to, to the dairy sites. So today, Rachel will actually take us on a journey and talk us, talk us through there. Rachel, the floor is all yours. Um, yeah, and thank you for inviting me to um, share uh, the, the Living Laboratory with everyone. Um, so I'll just put this up on the, the title slide and you can see um, how close uh, the Dairy Future Living Lab is to campus and it's right across the road at, at LUR and yeah. there. Um, the purpose of this talk, uh, when, when I was invited to, to speak, is I agreed basically because I really wanted to raise some awareness of what we're doing in the Living Laboratory and the Dairy Futures Living Lab. When it, when it was first conceived, and, and this is a, an office discussion, discussion with the Dean and myself at the time, wondering what we could do to revitalize LURDF because all the attention had gone to Ashley Dean um, back at that stage and, and we had a we had a, a resource that was kind of just falling under the radar a bit. So we came up um, with the living lab which the, the current VC had had already had um, this this vision of creating a campus wide um, living laboratory and I'm going to talk a little bit about that um, the wider campus vision as, as well as part of this talk and then go into a bit more detail about um, the, the living lab initiative itself um, with with respect to the dairy futures and, and some of the challenges um, that the world faces and and which of those challenges the dairy futures living lab is currently um, cherry picked to, to try and find solutions so it's not um, an exhaustive list and, and that's why hopefully you're here is to find out perhaps how you could you could be involved. Um, so in terms of Lincoln University wider vision, we have a, um, a strategy document um, from, from Council which essentially has a vision to become one of the, the top five land-based universities and I've developed a, a plan going forward for the next 
um, the nine year uh, 2028 of, of how they could do this through through renewal and, and um, shaping strategies. And um, that document, I'm, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, it's available um, online. But with respect to the first goal of here, the Living Lab University Initiative, that, that, and that's to create um, an end to end student experience. So, so basically, um, promoting all of those interactions between the, the end student and the end user, so the students um, and, and the wider community. And the idea behind that is to bring um, scientists, the academics, the students, and stakeholders together to to um, to research and explore the, the challenges that, that face um, the world and, and create those connections that Lynn has already been talking about as, as rural professionals, but you know we're, we're thinking about our next generation succession planning and, and how we bring those those students through and, and turn them into amazing graduates. So in terms of what the wider um, living laboratory, uh, we have a management group at the moment, which is led by um, Tracy Ann and, and, and Jerry, and they look after some of those living lab projects, which might be short-term <laughs> projects, shops, um, competitions, forums, essentially um, projects that get people together, students, academics, industry. Then we've got the long-term projects of the satellite projects, which uh, the Dairy Future Living Lab fits within one of those. So the, the Dairy Futures is, is an ongoing project that doesn't have an end. Um, if I run out of money, then it probably has an end. Um, <laughs> Revitalizing the Arboretum and the Mount Cart Forest and Bike Park. Um, don't ask me anything much about those other things because I don't I don't know so much, but there is some information in the contact person for those um, living lab projects on the website. <laughs> so moving into some of the, the challenges which are driving the past and, and current projects um, with the living lab and, and where I'm kind of reaching out to the wider community who are also looking at how they can um, demonstrate solutions or look at concept um, projects with regards to, to research. And there's, there's not really <laughs> any surprises here. We're, we're facing um, uh, the promise of, of more extreme weather events with flooding and, and, and droughts. Um, water quality of our, our rivers and, and streams has been in ongoing huge issue for us and, and one that we've put a lot of focus on investment in towards with, um, with respect particularly around dairy research. We've got increasing temperatures, we've got increasing um, carbon dioxide that might improve partial production but it's also going to increase the amount of water required to increase that, that um, plant growth under the changing um, climatic conditions. Uh, this this other little graph that I've, um, many of you probably can't see is uh, the fluctuation in the um, milk price. So for the, the dairy farmers, we go from over nine dollars to um, now below um, seven dollar payout. So you know, how do you how do you cope with such fluctuating prices and, and fixed costs that that pretty much are, are in, in par with your um, milk price? And then. Not completely separate from that is um, the shortage of, of skilled uh, labour, uh, mental health challenges, um, consumer expectations about their product and how their product is, is um, produced and manufactured and, and processed um, with the animal welfare aspect of, of milk production. By security challenges, uh, we've, we've already been through um, in Bovis and, and um, particularly at this farm, it's pretty close to home. <coughs> Other um, threats like foot and mouth disease could, could really impact our, our farming systems, as well as the growing need to um, be very responsible with um, antibiotic use and how that um, gets into the environment. So, so there's a lot of a lot of challenges and. Um, 
the, the Dairy Futures Living Lab is, is starting to, to move into the space to, to address some of these challenges to improve the resilience um, of, of farming systems. So, um, what is Dairy Futures uh, Living Lab? So it's, it's a couple of things, but in its, its um, most definite physical form, it's it's a farmlet at LUIPF. So a farmlet is a mini is a mini farm, and the the different colours in this map, which is um, at uh, across the road at LUIPF, uh, are two self-contained farms, and they contain about um, well, they contain forty cows uh, per per farmlet, and um, the the area that each farmlet is assigned is twelve hectares. So since 2018, we have been running those, those farmlets as um, their own self-contained farm. And in 2018, when um, we started the, the Living Lab, we wanted to come up with you know, two di divergent farms in the first instance. And one of the, the, the blue farm was, going, was initially called Advanced Technology. So this was going to be a farmlet that was a very early adopter of, of any technology. And I ran Halter and I looked, I contacted the spiky people and um, partial from space and wanted to get all of this technology um, into this farmlet so that it was kind of really futuristic looking and I got nowhere quite quite quickly. Um, this farm was going to be the uh, really low intensive self-contained kind of almost a system one dairy farm which um would, would winter on used to burst pastures lower stocking rate lower inputs so so the two farms were going to be um quite different in, in terms of how they looked but because i couldn't get a lot of those technologies and the um the advanced future one it's 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 settled back into being a control farm because I did get um, cow manager sent the tag, but I thought why get why get cow manager tags for one herd when I could get them for both herds. Um, so so that was um, that was where where the farms after two years actually um, went to was having a control farm which represented the best practice um, Canterbury now um, so it's it's called Dairy Dairy Now and, and we operate a, a system that um, is, is quite similar to what the demonstration farm um, practices. And the, the Dairy Future farm uh, is has adopted uh, more quickly some of the science around alternative forages and, and low inputs. We we were wintering on for the first couple of years as well. So, so that's why I've included the photos here of the, the different the different um, forages and the, the diverse pastures were a chicory, plantain, um, red clover, black clover, and Italian ryegrass um, mixtures. What the those farmlets are, are doing now is they have merged with a, a wider approach. Program so so we're collaborating with um, partners uh, and we've got PhD students involved to um, to join with the the low end farm systems program which has a, a, a very ambitious target to reduce uh, nitrate leaching by up to sixty percent of of dairy farms. To get to um, the point where we where we wanted to uh, essentially identify what that future farm looked like, we had to investigate all of the different nitrogen mitigations that were out there and and look at which ones would which mitigation would complement each other and how would they combine when we when we stacked each of those nitrogen mitigations. Onto another, so we did some pretty experimental modeling and in Barnax and an overseer to, to look at whether or not we could demonstrate through that modeling that we could actually reduce um, nitrate leaching by the target that we set ourselves. And then the next step is to, to actually demonstrate this um, in practice with uh, 
rally about that farm system mm -hmm. and the and the living lab. So so here are some of the, the outputs that we we were looking at when we uh, were doing the modeling. It was it was quite important that if we're trying to reduce nitrate leaching, that we're not pollution swapping and increasing the greenhouse gas. Um, uh, there are lots of air mitigation solutions out there that are also very expensive. So the other aspect that we wanted to make sure we weren't doing was um, uh, modelling ourselves out of the market, as it were, in terms of profitability. So we were we were also um, monitoring what impact those mitigations would have on profit. So the baseline farm, which is your yeah, Canterbury average 3.4 cows um, to the hectare, 190 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year um, on perennial ryegrass like clover pastures. So the first step we put on that was to reduce nitrogen fertilizer down to 100 units. So from 190 down to 100. And if you know anything about um, pasture response to, to nitrogen, for a farmer, um, taking out nearly half of their nitrogen is, is probably going to lose them at least one to one and a half tonne of dry matter per hectare, which is a lot of feed. Um, <coughs> so, so you've either got to manage that nitrogen really well, your feed utilisation really well, bring in more supplements or reduce the stocking rate or, or a number of different things to kind of um, trade off that, that impact of, of just reducing the nitrogen fertiliser. So one of those things was to um, incorporate Italian ryegrass, and there's been a lot of really good research out of CSCR group um, around the, um, using lysimeters that have demonstrated that Italian ryegrass, because of its full season activity, um, captures and, and retains nitrogen within the system to prevent um, nitrate leaching. And, um, and it also has a very high nitrogen response. So, so if we're reducing our, our nitrogen fertilizer, then we're also using a plant that's um, growing at a time that's going to um, hopefully maximize nitrogen insufficiency within the system. Then we modeled the next step, which was to include plantain. And um, plantain has shown that um, it's a very high moisture. Um, so it dilutes the nitrogen in the diet when it's excreted by the animal. So we, uh, if the animal's um, excreting 200 grams of nitrogen per day, if it's eating at least a third of its diet is plantain, then it's going to um, excrete more water with that nitrogen and maybe increase its urination events from 12 events to 13, 14 or 15 events which are more dilute. And it means that the that the Italian ryegrass that that falls on is more likely to capture the nitrogen um, and that urine patch uh, and, and not so much as being leached. Because there's more volume, there's potentially more area in that urine patch. So we get a more um, a greater coverage of urination. There is, depending on the stopping rate, a greater risk of overlap of urinations, which will increase nitrate leaching. But um, with the modeling that we've done and the, the lack of models that report the effect of this, the spatial aspect of, of urination patterns, um, this demonstrated quite a pronounced uh, reduction in expected nitrate leaching. Um, the other aspect about plantain is, is that uh, in metabolism studies with animals, we've also um, seen that the, the protein in plantain is more slower to degrade. In the rumen, so it doesn't turn into ammonia and get converted to urea as, as quickly as, as other species like perennial ryegrass and clover. So, more of that nitrogen is partitioned to milk or dung. We also looked at early calving as a mitigation, <laughs> and um, this, the thinking behind this was that. When, when our stocking rates and our feed demand in autumn is high, then the nitrogen intake is high. And the, the research that we've done in, with cows in autumn is they can be eating about 700 grams of nitrogen a day. And they'll, their milk productions drop right back. Only about 100 of that is actually going into milk. So the rest is predominantly going into urine and a bit into dung. So there's a lot of nitrogen being excreted from urine in autumn. And that's at a time where the plants are slowing their growth down, so they're not capturing that nitrogen. 
and the preceding has done quite a big drainage period. So we thought if we come earlier, then we're we're kind of shifting, we're shifting that um that nitrogen deposition during the season and getting a bit more autumn growth um time to capture the the, the nitrogen. So we're would be reducing our stocking rate and feed demand earlier in the season. Throughout this modeling process, and we've been doing this for 12 months prior to actually deciding on, on where we landed, um, we were we were consulting with the, the farmers, the, the management advisory group um, with SIP, who's the South Island um, Dairy Demonstration Centre. So we were getting their feedback on some of these um, mitigations, but we wanted to know if we if we went down this pathway. What's adoption likely to be like? Are farmers going to say there's just no way no matter how good it is? Um, are we ever going to do that? Or, yeah, maybe it's okay to be a little bit uncomfortable. Um, we're prepared, you know, give it a go, we're interested in the results. So um, when we put early carving to, to the farmers, the, the reaction was there's, um, there's a lot of risk and not a lot of gain in the numbers that you're showing us. And, um, the, the the change in, in nitrate predicted nitrate leaching really didn't demonstrate the, the theory that, that we had or the hypothesis that we had and there were concerns around the welfare of animals um, and the actions of farmers um, if they've got grass in autumn then they would simply just keep, keep grazing and, and not really get those good things in the end so we we've opted not to go with the with the early carving and the and the stack that were ultimately adopted. The Bainage wintering, so so that's going back back in time. Um, so in Canterbury, most farmers will um, will be wintering their cows on on crops such as kale, pot of beet or, or sweets. But in, in this instance we've modeled um, wintering on on pasture and, and having half and half diet with pasture and, and baggage, acknowledging that the stocking density will be lower, that there's a um there's, there's grassy that will regrow um, and capture the manure um, from that from that grazing which kale and water beet aren't regrowing um, once the animals have grazed it you've got to wait until you can get a, a catch crop in in order to hold the nitrogen. We also looked at um, standoff pads and um, nitrification and inhibitors and those were either um, predominantly to to expense of the, the big reductions in, in profit um, to put us against um, going down that pathway. So, so that's just a little bit more um, where, where we've got to where we're actually um, we're pushing the boat out a little bit further. We're, we're only going to be applying 80 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year in, in the future farmlet. And the stocking rates will be um, 3.4 cows per hectare in the control farmlet and 3.2 um, that's referring to the milking platform only. Um, the funding for the project um, is through Dairy NZ and MB and the, the other partners that I mentioned with Fonterra and CRC. Um, the, the contract is until December 2025, so the, there's funding to, to do two seasons, but um, there's, there's ambition that uh, uh, there's <coughs> funding that will carry that on for another couple of seasons after, after that. Um, with, there's been quite a bit of investment in this um, project and there's uh, lysimeters, sorry, not lysimeters, there's suction cups, ceramic suction cups in half the pattern in each um, farmlet so that we are enabled to measure um, paddock scale nitrate leaching. And the, the farmlets are well and truly underway. So, so that's what's happening in the in the farm and there's lots of opportunity for um for others to, to to monitor what's what's going on i'm not a soil scientist or a social scientist but if, if um as collaborations if, if you think there's opportunities to um use this resource to to capture more information um that can only be an effort in the wider community 
the living lab just is a, just a farm that we've got some concurrent research where, where we are interested in um, looking at solutions uh, for for feed quality, for milk quality, for um, animal welfare. We've also done a proof of concept component research and um, Dr. Christopher Mangway has done a lot of uh, research with, um, with Chippery and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. We've been um, working on, on young stock and, and um, lifetime productivity of, of animals. The, the involvement with CRV meant that we were also looking at um, Lorcurea phenotypes earlier in the in the program and, and we've published some results from having high and low Lorcurea cows and we've also been looking at um, how to manage fertilizer if we have to restrict how much we can use as there is um, tactical and operational ways in which we can really get most of our food out of our fertilizers. So this is um, this is some couple of pictures from from Christopher's work when um, when Christopher and I were, were talking about what to do for his his research. Christopher here, yeah, wave your hand. Um, <laughs> we <laughs> things were really taking off in the in the plantain world, and the the I, the concept of plantain arose from diverse pastures, which also contained chicory. Um, chicories like a lot of people and likes the summer and doesn't like the winter very much. So agronomy, agronomically, um, chicory can be a little bit more um, challenging and, and there was a lot more um, interest and investment opportunities for taking the plant to the glory um, further because of the, the attributes. But chicory was a little bit the poor, poor cousin and, and we thought we'd, we'd have a look and See what what chicory could do that um, that perhaps um, plantain couldn't, and Christopher was looking at um, the quality of the milk with regards to the, the fatty acids, as, as well as um, further developing uh, our own urine sensor. So, every search have got uh, um, a urine sensor that's got a refractor meter in it that um, measures the the uh, concentration of nitrogen in the <coughs> In the um, sensor and the volume, whereas this um, sensor currently just measures the, the volume, so it's um, time stamps when an animal urinates and how much they urinate. Uh, Hostel was working with um, Nigel Beale and, and Paige Fisher to uh, take to uh, incorporate a, a little sample cup from that um, from that device so that we can get a, a measure of the um, urinary end concentration. So uh, there's, there's plenty of um, precedents uh, published data on, on chicory. If you want to talk more about it, he's, he's in the room. The, the other um, satellite project is looking at, um, at the lifetime productivity of, of our young stock. And uh, one of the ideas is that if, if we can grow these animals out better and, and rear them to be more resilient, we're, we're actually improving um, more or less some of the, the methane challenges by having um, a higher success rate in terms of fertility and, and growth and, and um, milk production. So for the last um, three seasons, we've been comparing um, milk allocation uh, and artificial rearing uh, circumstances where calves have had six litres. Um, which is the, the recommended uh, welfare best practice and the artificial rearing with high milk allowance. So that's eight litres to help yourself um, scenario, which is what the calves are up in red under this year. And we've also compared that to a natural rearing um, conditions where the calves are staying, have stayed with their mothers um, up until the time that, that they are weaned. And um, we're going to be tracking these calves through as they come into their first and second lactation to, to look at how they perform. We're looking at how the, um, from the animal welfare point of view, how the, the mothers and calves interact. And the, the first couple of years, the, the, there's been some really positive outcomes in terms of the, the calf, calf growth. The, the health of the, the dams has been really good, but they have been really upset at the time of, of separation and um, we've 
we've tried a, a couple of different uh, ways to, to make that separation a little less stressful for the animals. And um, this year, maybe we've, we've nailed it, Paige. Um, things, are, things are going quite quite well in, in terms of the, the relationship between the cows and the, and the calves and the vocalizations that we're getting um, indicate um, a more settled dynamic. Um, the other the other one was around fertilizer and how to use um, fertilizers more more efficiently. Does that mean um, changing the way we apply fertilizers or or adding things to fertilizers to to, to get more um, pasture response from them? And and this project started um, as an honors. On this project, which we kept going for the 12 months to, to look at the um, total annual yield when we use these different products. So, and sorry, the text is a little bit small, but we've looked at using a slow release um, urea on its own um, at 40 kilograms per application versus um, applying urea more frequently at a lower application of 20 kilograms. Um, all of the, the nitrogen treatments had 190 kilograms of the per year. Per year we just we just um, applied it slightly differently depending on the on the product. So so we, we used um, uh, products that had um, hormones in them, such as cytokinins, which increase the, the tillering and potentially <laughs> reduce yield that way, that had um, a microbial uh, enzyme mix and and um, ultimately compared compared all of those um, additives. And while we did see some within um, application or within regrowth uh, differences, accumulatively across the whole season, the 190 um, units of nitrogen pretty much needed the same amount of, of pasture. So um, yeah, just wrapping things up, the. The, the living lab is, is something that myself and, and my colleagues are using as a, as a teaching resource. It, it's, it's a university um, uh, facility, uh, so, so it's, it's there to be used and there for students to, to engage with in, in whatever format um, that works. So, so this is one of the um, dairy production classes. We had, a, they were a, we had an AI technician um, coming in talking about um, artificial insemination. We've got um, visitors from overseas uh, who were at the, at the farm visiting at the same time as the, the tanker showed up and the tanker was more than happy to, to um, impart his, his knowledge and, and show, show what happens when, when milk's taken out of the vat. Uh, we, we work with Lincoln High School. They, every year, um, we get a call for the Adopt Scientist program and um, and we had two, two high school students come and um, look at the, the social behaviour of, of dairy cows when we joined heifers with mixed age animals um, halfway through winter. Uh, this is a class that's looking at, at grazing, grazing management, and our PhD students, Yabith and Holly, and, and Tony has just started her, her PhD looking at how we might. Um, Incorporate bio waste in a, in a more circular economy, so so managing food waste and, and just starting that process um, with with some early applications, and we're working with um, University of, of Canterbury and and um, applying the funding to to pursue um, the the waste management uh, research question. I think this is my um, second to last slide, which is just giving you an overview of some of the resources that are available um, at, at the farm for, for those of you who are interested in um, and reaching out for, for collaboration. Referential questions, 
um, very good talk there, Rachel. You talk about um, lowering nitrogen or you really reduce down to 80 kilos where you allow um, regulations 190, where the rear doesn't seem to be the problem. You've been I think, describing to us your um, urine is the problem and it's worse in the winter. So why are you limiting urea when that's not the problem? And my question is, are you looking in the wrong area? Okay, that, that's, a, that's a good question. So, um, so the it comes back to the nitrogen surplus on the farm. So what we're trying mm -hmm. to do is reduce our overall um, nitrogen surplus and then use things like urination behaviour to manage and retain that nitrogen within the system. So we're bringing in less nitrogen and the goal is to grow as much grass or maybe just a little bit less um, and, and lose a lot less. Did that answer your question is to reduce the nitrogen inputs altogether and, and to make, make it's Sort of like nitrogen leaching is the problem and urine appears to be the problem, not the urea if you put it on in um, small amounts like you're doing. So why would you limit urea when it's not the issue, it's not the problem? Or because the plant uses all the urea yeah. goes on because you're putting the right amount on and you can control that. Yeah, so when when we put when we put that urea on, it's, um, we are adding it in a way that it isn't likely to leach, like it's not going to leach in the form, the granular form that it is. The plant's going to take up that nitrogen. It, it'll increase the yield or it'll increase the crude protein of the diet so that the animal then eats more nitrogen. So when we're using 190, um, the crude protein, the nitrogen intake of those cows is going to be higher than the, the, the nitrogen intake of the ones on the lower um, end input system. So, so you're right, we're not leaching from the urea, but it's the, it's the transfer of that urea um, from the plant that takes it up into the animal, into the urine. Are you looking at the option? Are you are we looking at milk production? Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, so this is a small farm system, and I've, I've, um, so the so the farm's got a demovel system. So every day we know exactly how much each cow has has milked, um, and we're we're milking the herds into the vat. So we're going to be able to get the composition daily as well as doing herd testing. So um, we're going to capture. The total annual milk production and, and look at that, which we need for profitability for modelling at the end of the at the end of the program. Is that what you need? Yes. Yes. And do you have any resource so far, or this is the first season that we have? This is the first season with this stack, um, but it's you know it's the fourth season of, of running the living lab, and the the future farm has had lower stocking rate, and it has produced. Similar per cow milk, but on a per hectare basis, it has been less profitable. Um, we've, we've tried to um, reduce some of the costs by wintering on, but the, the lower stocking rate on a farm that grows grass really well has made it challenging for us to control um, feed quality in the, in the summertime. And in the first uh, year or two, we were Kind of just getting our heads around how we manage that feed surplus to maintain quality so that the, the future farm wasn't compromised because of our inability to um, keep, maintain partial quality. Any more questions, ladies and gents? Yeah. Um, with the calf rearing on the artificial milk versus the natural milk, what kind of differences do you see in calf growth? And, <coughs> any other, and we were talking about health as well, any specific stuff around the health and performance of the calves? Yes, um, so so the first year the, the calves were predominantly on whole milk as well, so we've, so we've had milk powder versus whole milk comparisons. The, the calves that were with their mothers grew much faster, nearly twice as quickly as the calves that were artificially reared. So, so they were and lived, they were drinking upwards of 12 litres a day um, and um, growing at a kilo a day at sort of less than four weeks of age. Yeah. There was someone had been up over the I'm not to Not less or something. 
Um, assuming that you're doing some animal health indicators as well, and as well, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so we are, um, and we need to report all this for animal ethics, um, at any rate, uh, but we need to get approval to, to do these, um, do these measurements. So, in terms of the, the animal health side of things, um, in the first couple of years, the somatic cell was a bit higher in the future farm, and um. After we lost everything through Envogus and got a whole new replacement herd, there's been no difference in the medic cell count or, or mastitis. Um, the, smart, the farm's quite small, um, so, so the leanness hasn't been, a, um, hasn't been an obvious issue. It's only if some of the, you know, if we get good survival in our cows and they get old, that's where we start to get the, the problems when we get when we build up nine and 10 year old animals, that's where the health problems. Um, Could you just run through that with the grazing pasture and which conclusion again? We landed with that one. So, so, if we went, so with the modelling, um, we had for both farmers, we had a five hectare support block. So, the total area was 17 hectares in the modelling. That five hectares on each farmlet, um, we either grew a, a kale crop um, for the Dairy Now farm, and those cows. That uh, wintered on kale would be fed um, baleage with most of the diet as kale. The future farm has also been wintered on a support block, but on pasture with baleage representing half of their diet. And the, the theory behind the improvement in nitrate leaching is because they're being back fenced and break fed, that the, the pasture is actually regrowing behind them and capturing a lot of that nutrient, which in a kale crop. Because it's higher yielding, you're stocking those animals more densely, and the risk of overlap is much higher. Um, whereas the risk of overlap in the pasture baleage wintering system is, is less. No, that's good. That's the way I answered. Yeah. I just misheard, so I just reported it. Yeah. <laughs> the, the Italian you put in, are you um, direct drilling it into existing pasture, or are you starting mm -hmm. from um, dirt? Um, so, a bit of both. Uh, to, to, we already had 60% of the farm in a diverse pasture, but we needed to get the farm to 100% of the pasture type that we wanted. So um, we we um, cultivated, no, we didn't cultivate, I think you pardon, we sprayed out um, and direct drilled into dead um, pasture um, for about 10% of the area, and the rest um, over the autumn we direct drilled plantain and Italian ryegrass onto the existing pasture. Right, one last year. Yeah, just further to that, if we could, um, what do you think is the 10 year plan in terms of that? Hopefully, how regularly are you going to be stitching in more plantain, more Italian ryegrass? Um, the, what's been really pleasing um, since we started this is when we, when we established the diverse mix. Um, uh, with the support of Agricom, by the way, uh, they um, the the mixture remained diverse without the perennial ryegrass in it. The um, the the diversity lasted about two and a half seasons before we started to see the clover get a little bit too much, which meant our autumn feed situation got a bit dire. <coughs> so so stitching. Italian annual plantain is required into those areas as a way of kind of, I think, going going forward. Mm. But is it every two years? Every two to three years, yeah. Well, ladies and gentlemen, be stringy in thinking the ritual for this. And a couple of slides to emerge you that we have a couple of. Other cool events uh, coming on. And um, then I invite you to have another uh, drink and about to eat with us. Uh, we like to close at about 5 30. Um, so if you want to continue talking, make sure you exchange business cards and, and make appointments with each other. Um, we're looking at, uh, at, at Oxford. Um, we are having a excellent series where we are actually heralding the campus here at the university. So uh, my collection is actually in, um, in, in our uh, recreation and our sports lab where he does the research. So he will actually talk to us about the importance uh, of athletes. We're going to talk about the future of pet food. 
And um, this will be another five events, so very similar, similar to, to, to this. Um, and then we have an innovation series where we actually going to talk about the, the synergies that are possible between science and and and, and mathematics. Thank you very much. And oh, we have one more. Let's go to Derek and uh, Dr. Adam Thompson is coming here. She was here. She was at the um, uh, Food HQ uh, up, uh, up on uh, Messi, and now she's actually working on um, uh, growing dairy out of plants. Uh, quite interesting as well. Thank you very much, Philip and Rachel, and please enjoy the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>